I'm John Swick. Um, I wrote the book, I'm the author of the book, uh, Since It's Golden Age, and before that I had a Luscombe's Golden Age. Um, it just amazes me, um, as I travel through this, all the tremendous writers out there that nobody ever wrote a book on the 108 since and until we started to work on my I did a Luscombe book, and my publisher said, why don't you do a Stinson book? And I said, well, surely somebody's written one. Started looking into it several years ago, and nobody had did a really good Stinson book. Um, and I said, well, yeah. So I started putting it together, and we ended up with a two-volume set. I, I, sometimes I have books. The publisher had some heart problems. I ordered some books. They make me buy books. I, they don't give me books. And I uh, sent the check in to Stockton to get books with a Publisher, they discovered that he had, he went in for a triple bypass and they didn't open any mail. <laughs> they didn't open up a check, so they didn't send many books. But nobody, I talked to his wife and she said, Oh, yes, well, you got mail here. And I said, Well, so I have one, I have one set of books that I'd sell uh, here if anybody was interested in purchasing a book. So I, the publisher sells books. I don't have to sell books, I do keep them for uh, some for anybody that wants one. That's all I had. I got a, one of the Luscombe books. Um, here, so if anybody is uh, interested. Also, I had some of these, and there, I've only got two left, but anybody can come up and look at this, and there, it's, it's uh, so you're going to buy an airplane. Some people saw this last night. This is really a funny thing on why you should buy an airplane, and you just have to read it. I wish I'd have made more copies so everybody could have had one, but I didn't think about it. I run some copies, so anybody can have those that, that, that wants one. Um, I have another book in progress. I thought I'd have it done. Uh, Stinson's early years, 25 to 43. Um, this is maddening. Uh, it's been in progress for several years. The uh, small publishers farmed this out. He farmed it out to a young woman, and they had a falling out, so that set us back. He, but I have two some manuscripts here. Anybody can look at them. Uh, there's several errors in it. Uh, we're working away on it, but there anybody wants to they'll be laying out here so everybody can go through them and look at them. Um, it's coming. Hopefully by next year we'll have it have it done. I don't say that I know everything about everything, but um, let's uh, talk about a couple things. I talked about this last night, and somebody said this airplane was in England, but just because it's printed doesn't necessarily mean the truth. And I, it's really frightening as an author. You write it down just because it's written down. Um, that doesn't mean that I couldn't make a mistake and be wrong. I live in Colorado. The Denver Post lies to me every day. Um, it has a political statement, but they are, <laughs> you don't believe everything they put in their, in their paper. But anyhow, this thing is it's laying out here on the bottom, about right by the tail, there's a checkerboard picture. These people said that this is exactly the way they were done in England, and it... Uh, uh, they use it for scale on the airplanes, and and it's that's, it's erroneous. Uh, anyhow, I, I just anybody that wants to look at that. The other thing is, I did pull out a sheet on L5s, and I got a picture. This is out of the Census Golden Age. Um, the first L5 that lit on Iwo Jima. And my picture doesn't show any 50 caliber machine guns on the, on the wings. I spent several years with a comm chief in a tank company years ago. 50 caliber is a heavy thing to pick up and carry around. If anybody ever had any experience with 50 caliber machine guns, uh, <laughs> you had one on each wing, uh, it'd be interesting. Anyhow, this, the picture of this, if those of them lit there, according to the, the this came out of a magazine, uh, I'm not sure, sure. Marine Corps, a U.S. Marine Corps uh, photo. It was a Marine Corps, uh, Marine Corps uh, newsletter uh, that the, they lit. A Marine uh, soldier run and jumped on the struts. Uh, immediately, they touched down. They started getting a uh, Japanese mortar fire on the on the on the landing field. Um, things weren't very secure. If you just touch down and you're starting to take mortar fire on the on the runway. And they taxied him off far enough away he was out of mortar range. Anyhow, I, this is I this is over here. Anybody can look at this. It's kind of a fun, fun thing. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the V77 and the AT19, and probably the people here probably knows more about it than I do. And, and as we travel along, if you have any questions or you want to correct me, speak up, because I don't. It isn't all knowing and all. I don't know everything about it. As I did the research on the AT19, Simpson in '41 decided that they would like to sell some aircraft to the to the military. Now they were selling this. You know, they made one that was a kind of this slow takeoff and landing one. Um, they were marketing some of them, and they realized that Beach was selling aircraft, uh, Howard was selling aircraft, and uh, uh, Fairchild was selling aircraft to the you know, civilian type aircraft. So they submitted the SR-10, a 450 horsepower one, and the military looked at it and said, yes, it's a fine airplane, but it doesn't have the structural integrity that we want to put student pilots in. And you have to uh, take all the abuse that a student would. So they turned it down. So then they said, can we re-engineer a new airplane? They said, yes. And so they built the V-77. And it's a very similar to the, uh, the SR-10s, except it's altogether different. It's all structured different, uh, a lot more metal in it. And the Air Force gave them the number 1819 uh, assigned to them. And their first engineering analysis started in March of 41, and by July of 42 they had one flying um, on the aircraft. Well, they submitted it to the aircraft again. This this time it had the structural integrity. Um, they were a little underpowered, uh, consolidated, or Volte owned uh, Lycoming, and the Lycoming, biggest engine they had is what they put in that, and Stinson really wanted a 450 Pratt in it. And uh, Voldy said, or consolidated, they were out of uh, San Diego then, uh, headquarters, no, we own, we own Lycoming, you're going to put a Lycoming engine in it. And they would have liked to have had a little more horsepower. I, some people are putting 450s in them now, but Stinson wanted a bigger, bigger engine, and they was... The company said, you can't do that. Um, well, they submitted it as a trainer. Now, at th that time, uh, and still do, all of aircraft are trainer aircraft in the military. The steerman was the instructor sat behind, and the student sat in front. The BT-13 was the same way, and the uh, um, AT-6 the same way. And as a trainer, the Air Force did not use any side-to-side -side trainers until you transferred into twin-engine stuff if you're going into multi-engine. And they said, no, we don't need this. Since has had a tremendous amount of investment in this airplane, and the Air Force didn't want it. The Navy didn't want it. So, But they had really good connections. They went to the British Embassy in uh, Washington, D.C. and said, can we sell this to you in Orlando lease? And uh, Fleet Air Arms said, yes, we'll take it. Well, in Orlando lease, it was free. Uh, the, on their land lease, the government paid for it, they give it to them. Theoretically, they, at the end of the war, they're supposed to give it back. Well, how could they turn it down? Here they have these fine uh, five place airplanes for free. So they said, yes, we'll take them. So they wrote a contract. The first contract was for 250 airplanes. Um, and Stinson retained one aircraft. It's a uh, NC. Uh, 13305, and it's still flying today, it's the last I knew, uh, but they retained one aircraft and the uh, they, uh, Fleet Air Arm got uh, uh, 249 airplanes. Then they finished that and since it still had capacity, they went back and pitched the Fleet Air Arm and they approached the government and they said, yes, we'll do another contract for another at least 250 airplanes. Um, the second group uh, there's 250 airplanes. The U.S. Navy got 10 airplanes. Canada received 10 airplanes. Stinson retained one aircraft, and I don't know the end number of that. And so the Fleet Air, Fleet Air Arm got 229 airplanes on the, the second, second group. Um, the, um, it was really interesting. Part of the Lend-Lease contract with Stinson, that the government would pay for the Propeller and uh, power plant had no charge to Stinson. They paid directly the propeller supplier and uh, Lycoming. Uh, Stinson's price to the on the contract, the first one was twenty-two thousand four hundred and ninety-six dollars. That was about the retail price 
of a SR-10. They were selling this thing to the to the government for land lease at retail price, and they were furnishing the engine and propeller. This was really profitable for Simpson. <laughs> they were, you know, I don't know, I don't have price on the second contract, but I assume it's very close. Uh, they uh, 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 we'll talk a little more about the, the shadow numbers. Uh, if you see a pictures of these of Simpsons that were in England, they have these numbers on the side of them. And the English developed this thing and they used it on their Air Force airplanes and their Navy airplanes. Uh, they were just erroneous numbers. They were made to confuse the German intelligence. And modern historian just drives you crazy if you're trying to figure these out because they have no rhyme or reason to anything. They're not, they're not hooked on the serial numbers or anything. They're, they're shadow numbers on the side of these uh, British World War II airplanes, uh, which is, I found, really uh, interesting. But at the end of the war... What? What? You don't think the Air Force used the British? Well, if the, if the Navy, all the Navy ones, yeah. really, there is a, a, a massive story to facility and you could go and ask for all the records, just to in there, and these slightly covered, and put out the records for each of them. Well, they had the whole the RAF, but the Navy ones you couldn't the Navy ones, yeah. You could look them all up. Well, yes, but they didn't, uh, but they were made to confuse the German intelligence and the Navy intelligence. And the Navy intelligence. Well, yes, but they didn't, uh, but they were made, just as design primarily, to confuse the German intelligence. You know, that was what the shadow numbers were for uh, on them, yes. Um, and I'm not a real authority on that once you get out of 1819s, how they did it. Uh, at the end of the war, um, the fleet air arm sent back a, uh, aircraft. Now, they received 478 aircraft, my records. Now, during the 43 and 44 when they were producing these things, they Stinson flew the, the aircraft completed to uh, back east and they crated them and put them as top freight on ships going to England. And they didn't weigh very much, relatively speaking, to what ship cargo was. So a tanker could have one on, a, a freighter could have two or three on, they just shipped them out this way and when they got them to England they hadn't crated them. Well, the Germans were sinking ships right and left, and 47 of uh, these 1819s were laying on the bottom of the Atlantic in a crate on the ships that were sunk. The, 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 at the time, there had been very little talk about that. I'm not authority on naval history, but the Germans just sunk ships. 42, they just shipped, they sunk hundreds of ships. Now, as the time went on, we built up our resources and we shut their submarines down. But anyhow, 47 of these things never got to England because they were on the ships that were sunk. Uh, 79 of these aircraft were lost in accidents. They seemed to be able to ding them up. They, they rode off 79 uh, aircraft, strung them out over the country, whatever they did with them. Uh, so at the end of the war, they sent 352 back to the United States. I have a, a press release, Western Flying, in June 1946, since in 1819 is on a surplus list. They, they were disassembled. You had to put the wings on them and fly them home. But they were $1,500, $2,000, and $2,500 uh, as is, where is, the 1800 back there, and you had to put them together. And they sold them. Now, Stinson, if you had a deal, if you flew it to the factory with a liberal application of time and money, they would make it into a civilian airplane. But you could take the airplane home and do your own rehab. So there's, they were both, both ways. You could, uh, you could. Uh, they were all, they were all sold. Uh, an interesting thing. Uh, all army surpluses. This is controversial, but I've done a bunch of research on this. Uh, the old CAA. All army surplus and navy surplus airplanes got five-digit numbers. And if you go to a fly in and you see a Sturman of the five-digit number, you're Probably that's the 46th number that was given to them during surplus. Now, people say, well, they got different numbers on them. You took them home and you could put a number on them. But the CAA give all Army surplus had five digit numbers. Um, they, uh, on the SR, on the 1819s, you flew it home, 
and then you applied for your number with whoever the region, the regions was different than they are now, they give you a number, and then you get your air weather certificate. Um, and so they, they were, they come out with different, different numbers. I, uh, I'll have this laid over anybody wants to look at this. Um, the, it's really fun. I did an analysis. I didn't try to do all of them. I, well, the ones I could identify, uh, the lowest number was 49,252, and the highest number was, uh, in, and back then everything was NC, uh, 9103. And each block, well, manufacturers today and even then, uh, the CAA would give a manufacturer a block of numbers. And then when they use them up, since them use their number, and then the, the next block would be when they give to Piper or to Howard or to Cessna or somebody, and then they use those up, they would come back. Um, and so each region had was assigned numbers if people wanted to number airplanes. So depending on the region that you s certified your airplane on, you took it home, you, they give you a number. So the numbers are just wild on the AT-19s as far as, uh, and I have a list of end numbers and shadow numbers and and uh, military uh, serial numbers. I couldn't put them all together, but these are the ones I can identify. And I'll lay it over here so anybody who wants to look at it can, can look at the thing. Um, um, this is probably dull and boring trivia, but this consolidated, this is a numbering system. Each one of these factories have their own numbers. Cessna has their own numbers. Everybody has their own numbers, what they put them. Um, Consolidated, used two digits numbers. That Model 28 was a 1933 PBY Catalina. I hope everybody knows what that flying goat was. Um, 19, model 32 was a 1939 B-24 bomber. And, and uh, Model 36 was 1941 uh, the B-36. And I was really amazed that they were starting to work on the B-36 in 1941. Didn't get to fly them until about 48. I don't know if anybody knows. I'm not an authority on B-36s. Now, Volte, they hadn't merged yet. And I don't know why they, they didn't have that many airplanes, but they started with 48, the earliest one I have, 1939, the P-66. There was a little round engine airplane they sold mostly to China. They weren't very successful fighter, a really small, petite little fighter. Uh, Model 51 was, uh, 1939 was the BT-13. Uh, Model 74 was an O-49, this was this, uh, it was built by Stinson, but it was under faulty uh, slow takeoff and landing airplane. Uh, model 76 is the L5, uh, 1941. And in 1941, 76 was the, the next number was 77, and Stinson just put a V on it for uh, victory or for, uh, and V77 was the AT-19. In, in 1941, it would, this is just in their sequential order how they got to the V-77. They just put a V-V on it. Um, um, after the merger, they went to three-digit numbers. And I, the L-13 in 1944 was uh, Stinson's number one of, uh, consolidated volume 105. And they built a few of them, or they come out with Franklin engines and they put radial engines on them. Maybe you see them, big, ugly, old metal. They didn't build very many of them. Uh, in 1944, Stinson decided they needed to replace, and we'll talk about that after a while, uh, to replace the 108 Stinson. And they were developing, they had one that flew. In fact, it flew from Wayne, Michigan to California. They built a, it was a five place, low wing pusher, all metal aircraft, fixed landing gear. Uh, uh, and that was going to be the 108 replacement. Uh, and the next one, uh, in 1944, they, they were decided to do a four-place airplane, so they went back. At that time, Consolidated Volte's headquarters was in California, San Diego, and they needed a new number. And uh, so they what can we have a new number? So San Diego sent them the next number. The last one was 106, and they hadn't, didn't have any other airplane coming down the line. They sent them 107. And since the uh, advertising people said, we don't like 107, it don't sound very good, give us another number. So S San Diego ship, uh, sent them uh, uh, 108, they thought, well, this sounds pretty good. If they hadn't changed it, we'd all be flying 107 instead of 108 today. 
uh, consolidated like the 108 number, and they, they so the 107 was never assigned to anybody. It, it jumped up to uh, 109 was uh, the XB 46 uh, in 1945, which was kind of interesting. They went on with this other numbers, but that's how we got 108 because they didn't like 107. I don't know whether anybody likes 107 better. They didn't like it, which is kind of, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, the, we, let me get a drink of water here. No. There's all kinds of rumors. There's all kinds of rumors how they, uh, why, why they picked 108, and I don't know. Uh, because, see, the last ones they were built was a 10A before uh, the end of World War II, and then the Stinson, the, the round engine Stinsons, but that, that were 10As. Um, and I don't know what, I don't have that, what the Stinson's uh, 10A number was, not off the top of my head. I don't know how they picked out 108. There's all kinds of rumors. If they're supposed to go that fast, I don't know. I don't have any idea. Uh, somebody knows, tell us. Um, at the end of the in 1946, and I found this kind of interesting, and um, um, Randy, in his email, come out on this of everybody. I've got a copy of that email. Was it? That was a. Well, I run files on people. Um, I, I have a file on you. I, and most anybody I correspond with have a file. I've lost too much stuff on my computer. I, I have file drawers and file drawers with other file holes. I get, I print out emails and I put them in a file. I can make notes on a piece of paper. I can't make notes on my computer screen. And, uh, and so I run, a, I run files on people. Somebody called me up a while back and they want to know something. They said, well, let me pull your file. You got a file on me? Well, yes. <laughs> because, anyhow, I just bought a new, new really nice two-door file cabinet because I'm filled up the others. But anyhow, um, he mentioned in this that there was a 2445 uh, round engine Stinson's built and about 235 left today, more, some coming and going, uh, you never know. When I went back and looked through my records and uh, in the manuscript over here, I did a great deal of work on the type certificate numbers and production figures. And I came up with, uh, he had 2445, I come up with 2346. I'll go back and look at mine. I don't say I'm infallible, but I'm pretty close. And that included all of the tri-motors and everything that they, that they did. Well, it, the, if I looked at my numbers uh, that um, with the 33 that I looked, there was about 2336 census built prior to World War II, uh, 1,075 three engine ones, so they, they built about 3371 airplanes when they shot down for the war. This is not the military aircraft. And my records, this is, was published. On January 1st, 1946, the CAA listed how many airplanes they had was available on the, uh, on the listing. And Stinson had 1,485, and that means that about 1,800 airplanes was destroyed or something that would, didn't make it. But there was 1,485. I'll lay this over so people can look at it. There was uh, 1,667 Wacos. I got a good time with my Waco friends. Um, Waco, Texas is spelled the same way. Waco is spelled the same way, but you pronounce it the airplane Waco. <laughs> it all depends on where you, who you're talking to. Um, uh, 1675, 1485 uh, Stinsons. Uh, Fairchild's is entered in 49, and there was only 160 Stagger Wing Beach. 
uh, the beach didn't build very many airplanes. I was really surprised it was that low. But I have all of the, the there's a list of all of the, uh, people can look at this, how many was, was listed at that time. Um, Oh, go through my papers here. The next thing, I got a wing rib. This young man gave me a wing rib. I got to talk about that. I collect wing ribs. I'd like to find a pre-war Stinson. I have a, a 31 Stinson Model S rib and a 28 uh, Fairchild. The Stinson, 31 Stinson was metal. It was a kind of built like T-sections, kind of looked like a Piper used. Well, it was a little heavier material on their, their, their ribs, uh, uh, but I, I'm, I'd like to have a, I'm really like to have a staggering beach, uh, if anybody has one of them, and, uh, or any of the, the older ones. Anyhow, I have this, it'll lay this over anybody who wants to look at it. Um, um, now, oops. <laughs> We got plenty of time. I've got more time than I thought I was going to have. So let's go into a couple of things that might be fun. Um, in the Stinson book that's coming, and you can look at this, I did a, a production by model by year. I uh, did a great deal of research on this that you can look up. Uh, for example, if you're looking at, um, let's go back to one of these days. You know, oh, let's take 38, um, and I will use uh, Joseph Jumpers, if I pronounce his book. Um, I was able to go online and look up these numbers uh, from my own research. I did a lot of research on this to, to, to develop each one of them. Uh, SR-10C, they built 37. SR-10G, uh, it's the, the SR-10C, silver, 10,995 SR-10G. Uh, it was powered by 290 horse Lycoming. They built 12 of them. Uh, the SR-10H, they didn't build any. <laughs> they had model, but they didn't sell any. The SR-10E, a going. Um, um, they had a 320 horse right that's over 14,000. They built, built eight of them. So I went through this, did a lot of research on it. Uh, I don't know how many people is down the line, historians want to do that. Um, they, um, anyhow, you can look at this. This is what I'm trying to get put out. And now, last year we talked about a couple things and uh, get some feedback of uh, what we're going to talk about. I talked about the Piper takeover. Most everybody was here about the Piper Stinson or the lack of no such thing as a Piper Stinson. And we, we can talk about that. And we can talk about the all Piper Apache. Uh, there's stories out that it was a Stinson design and it's not, a, it's not that's erroneous. Uh, we can, we can, we can uh, talk about that. Uh, does anybody have, a, what would you like to have a discussion? Maybe we keep maybe like another 15 minutes or so. Okay. But one other question that I often hear is, did Piper actually make the Stinson Apache in 1908? No. Or did they just rebrand it or not? How did that work? The last um, uh, 108 Stinson was built in June of 48. Um, well, see, the whole thing is um, consolidated. It was Convair by that time. It was built in B-36s, and they were just losing money on tons of money. Now, they also owned railroads. They owned all kinds of stuff back east. It was profitable. And, but the B-36 thing was just, was just terribly. So the back, this incident was owned after the initial Stinson formed the thing, it was always owned by back east money. They decided, we've got to get rid of this. Uh, it's going to sink us. So they split the company in two, consolidated, went with, set it off, and then the other company was a, a different company. And they had to find somebody to buy it. Nobody wanted to buy it. They had to give this guy about $500,000 just to take it. 
so he took over the, and I can't remember his name, took over a consolidated voltage. And it was Stinson, and they had a factory. The BT-13 factory was sitting empty in, in California. They were building parts of San Diego, and then they had the big plant at uh, Fort Worth where they were selling B-36s. So he had all that. They, they were working on this Convair two-engine uh, transport. They made a bunch of DC replacement. They had it coming. He thought that he could make this profitable, but he had no use for this for the Stinson thing. And he suggested to the headquarters of San Diego, we'll just close Stinson up and sell it off. Well, they convinced him that we should move it to San Diego, the reduction, sell the factory there, and we'll build them until as long as they're profitable. We won't do it with any money on it. Now, they had this uh, uh, all-metal low-wing pusher flying at that time uh, that they were... Uh, that they were working on, and so the thing just stopped. They were going to send them to San Diego. Well, in the meantime, a Piper plus money. I pick on J3s. Anybody's a J3 fan, I just really beat up on J3s. J3s don't have any 43, what is it, 4330 tubing? Is that the good tubing? Is that the right term, 43? 4130. They don't have any of that. They use all pre work cheap tubing in them. Now, the PA 11s and the Super Cubs have the better tubing. Uh, J3 is cold, they don't, they're slow, you can't see out of them, you have to fly over the back seat. Uh, but old man Piper, when they got ready to build J3s and 46, rather than doing any analysis uh, uh, on cost, he just wanted to pick a picture down and said, we're going to wholesale them for this much money. Piper lost money on every J3. They just lost tons of money. And they went into receivership. Uh, they couldn't pay their bills. Well, the back east money, had Piper, the same back east money was all friends with Consolidated Volte, and somebody suggested, why don't we just force Stinson off on Piper? That'd be the easiest way to do that. Well, old man Piper was against that. He fought that, but he couldn't do it because he'd lost control of the company. He was still on the board. And uh, uh, so he went out there, but he was a smart old cookie. He went around and looked at Stinson Flat. Stinson had just tons of steel tubing. Barrels and barrels of dope, uh, fabric, all just all kinds of supplies. Uh, in fact, the, the first uh, Pacers um, all used Stinson dome lights in them. Uh, lot of they, they shipped back. Anyhow, he, he knew he couldn't stop it, but he was smart enough to know that, hey, there's a treasure trove here. So he agreed on this, and of course, then they, 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 were, crank, they were cranking up stuff to ship it to San Diego, and so they just stopped everything. Uh, he went out and looked at it. Well, the J3 is essentially, and you have to remember, I'm biased. Uh, J3 is essentially a home-built airplane. You can build everything at home on a J3. Uh, well, Piper didn't have the tools, the stamping equipment that die the stamps, you know, the presses, to handle the Stinson tooling uh, for the fins and the rudders, all that stuff. He didn't have dies do that. So he, he, I said, he said, Piper said, I'll never build a Piper in my factory. And he just left all the tooling there at San Diego. They shipped everything back, all the spare parts, everything they had created, uh, all the assembly jigs, except the dies to make this fin and rudder and some of the other stuff. He said, well, I don't, I'm not going to build one of those. So they, they just shipped uh, everything back to, to Piper. Piper built, engineers did the corrugated. You can buy, Univer has a corrugated fin. Um, now and, and I think the elevators, uh, there's a Piper design because they didn't have any tooling. They was needed the parts. In fact, they disassembled two Pipers, two Stinsons for parts, uh, to sell parts. So, and Piper never took the type certificate. Consolidated, which would be Convair, had the type certificate. When Univer bought the, the, the design from Piper, Consolidated transferred the type certificate right from San Diego to Denver. Typer never owned the type certificate. They couldn't build an airplane. First, they didn't have enough tooling. They didn't have the type certificate. They didn't have a production certificate. And then old man Piper said, I'm never going to build one of these. So there was no build. But they had about, I can look at the numbers, um, 400 and some airplanes sitting out in the field, and they sold them off, um, off of the, out of the field. Well. Let me get this here if I got just a second. 
The consolidated, the, the, the contract said Piper got all of the tooling, all the jigs and dies and anything they wanted. They didn't get the stamps, the big pressing, they needed the factory. Uh, the factory was sold to General Motors uh, Allison Division, I believe. I think they still own it as far as I know. Somebody said they tore a bunch of it down and rebuilt it. But anyhow, they, uh, 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 the way the deal was cut, Piper gave them 2,000 shares of stock. Later on, an unfriendly takeover that bid them. But, uh, so there's no money changed hands. Piper just wrote 2,000 shares of common stock to Consolidated Volte, and they got everything they wanted uh, out of that. Uh, um, they had all these Piper senses sitting there. Before the end of production, they rented some land, a, a bunch of space, at the old uh, Willow Run Airport, and they put a bunch of airplanes out there unassembled. They just took the wings and they just brought them out there and, and so they could assemble them. Some of them, they were, they were still in silver. They had to paint them in silver. Then they had a bunch of them at the factory. Well, when Consolidated owned the Stinsons, when a Piper deal picked them up, Piper uh, bought them for $280, 200, 200, some really cheap price. It was really profitable. It bailed Piper out, the, the sale of the Stinsons to the dealers. But when they quit production in June of 48, they did a a bit weight and balance of every aircraft. But when the Piper dealer picked them up in 48, 49, and 50, uh, Consolidated rewrote the weight and balance when they wrote the bill of sale. So if you got one of these that says Piper Simpson, and you say it's a Piper Simpson, the weight and balance will say when, uh, when the Piper dealer picked up the aircraft at the day of the bill of sale. They just rewrote the weight and balance. All they did just rewrote it and signed it. Uh, so it, people say, well, yes, I've got a 49 or 50 Piper Simpson. And the weight and balance will say 49 or 50. But they actually, they didn't build any after June of 48. Uh, so it's really confusing. It's really too bad. And it, but that's what they did. They were pretty cagey about that. Uh, I've got a, if you can look at this. I did a whole page on the serial numbers. Why? Uh, uh, how the, the serial numbers where they they come out? Let's see if I can find this. I can't um, on the. I don't know if I can find it here right quick. Um, to set down. And oh, see, most factories you pick up an airplane, they're sequential. They come off the assembly line. Uh, when you went to Wayne, Michigan, or. Uh, will run to pick up an airplane, you got to pick out the airplane you wanted. And then he went to the real bill, bill of sale. So there's bill of sales, all kinds of dates. Um, I did a sequential order on its sale number. FAA, that was really in, back then, and it was cheaper to get them than they are today. I just kept ordering and ordering and ordering and ordering the end numbers from the CAA, FAA in Oklahoma City. I was good standing with them. Um, you could buy them for like three or four dollars a piece when I was putting this together. Now they're ten dollars, I think, to get a to get a thing. Anyhow, I got about I don't know how many, and to, to check these numbers, you know, you could get the. Uh, in fact, some of those come with microfiche. I had to buy a microfiche reader to to read them, <laughs> which I threw away now. I don't need it anymore. But you can you can get them to put them in. But they. Um, um, you can see where they, they, they put them together. Um, does that answer the question? Well, yeah. I, am I talking too much? Yeah, Jonathan, one more question before we wrap this up is, yes. um, I've talked to a lot of people who have been curious, what was going on in the industry at the time of 47, 48, when uh, our aircraft was being produced, but meanwhile, Beechcraft was coming out with what was considered a spaceship Well, starting in about 38, 39, <coughs> uh, the engineering some, engineering, some companies were really advanced on their engineering and some were still Stone Age. Uh, if you look at the, for example, I have a BC-12 Taylor craft 
It's the crudest thing you ever saw. That it, the design was laid down at 38. You look at uh, Luscom today, their designs laid down and they were just miles ahead of them design wise. Uh, the air coop come along in 41 and it was just miles ahead of anybody else. Um, some people were really ahead. Piper was Stone Age. Uh, they, he didn't want to do anything. Um, he fought the, 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 the Piper, the, the, the Apache thing. Uh, didn't want to do that. His kids forced him into it. Uh, Beach had really advanced engineers and they uh, really forward thinking on the, on the Bonanza. Uh, uh, the Navion came out at the, and even though it was slower than the, it was really advanced tricycle landing gear retractable, the, um, the Republic come out with a CB, this high wing pusher thing, you know, it was way underpowered. Today, some people put big engines in and making them fly. But that was, some of these companies were really, really um, had advanced thinking engineers that was, was thinking about this. Uh, Simpson was working on this pusher, but they developed the, the, the 108 series. Uh, the, the fun thing about the 108 series, just one quick thing, the, they come out with a Dash 3 and they, you know, everybody knows they got bigger wing tanks, they beefed them up. Uh, the fuselage, the bottom of the fuselage, they used the same out ex uh, ex exterior tubing with the th walls were thicker. But now their thinking was that the 108-3 was a 165 horse engine. The next year they were going to have the dash 4 and it was going to be 180 horse. And they had an 80, 180 horse flying, they flew it to California. And that would be the dash 4. And the dash 5, for the next year, was to be the 235 horse engine, and they beefed them up. And that's why they put the big tail on them, so they could handle the, the more horsepower. Uh, and they didn't, one, they didn't intend to do any more engineering, just to increase the engines. Uh, Franklin said that they would take the CB engine, which is a 235 engine pusher, they'd turn it around and make it a tractor, and they could put it into the, into the, uh, as a, would it be, dash five? Um, with a 235, and by that time they would have their low wing pusher, all metal pusher certified. But yes, some people were just really um, Aronka. If anybody look at the Aronka uh, sedan, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice airplane, but it's I can outrun it on my foot if, my foot, if you're a uh, foot good foot race. Uh, uh, they just weren't thinking ahead as their engineering staff, it all depends on what their engineering staff was, but there's nothing wrong with the Ronca's exam except that it didn't sell very good. I, you know, there's nothing wrong with it except it's terribly slow, but it's terribly behind the time and nobody, so it just depends on who the engineering team was, what you had. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, we can expect to see this manuscript available I hope it's done by this time next year. Yeah, very good. I have to go to San, I have to go to Las Vegas and live with him. I'll, I'll go down there. Do you have any of the uh, Stinson Golden Age books for sale? I've got one set. The, I ordered some. I was low on them. I trade them for wing ribs, and once in a while, people come by and I'll sell them. Um, and I sent the check to the uh, Stockton, and he was he discovered he had to have this bypass. It scared him. And they didn't open any checks. So I called him and talked to his wife. She said, oh, yeah, the letter's laying there. We haven't opened it. <laughs> so they didn't say, I have one set of books I'll sell. That's all I have. Okay. Sorry about that. I thought I'd have more, but. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Is that it? Yeah. Thanks, John. Appreciate that.